thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, Blackgate Interviews Jim Butcher here at Confusion. So my name is Brandon Grimm, I'm a science fiction and fantasy author from Ottawa, uh, part of the programming team for CanCon, which is Ottawa's uh, science fiction and fantasy writing conference. <laughs> there we go, I got one fan in the other, that's freaking sweet. Uh, <laughs> You're in America now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and as well, I'm a, a reviewer um, and columnist for Blackgate Magazine, uh, which is my official capacity here today, and I am incredibly honored and, and pleased and privileged to be sitting down with Mr. Jim Butcher. Sure, you know uh, the Dresden Files and the Codex Alera and the Cinder Spire series and kind of short fiction and countless other amazing things. Uh, so, thank, first of all, thank you for joining this, Jim. This is awesome. Sure. Um, so, what we're going to do is uh, I've got a bunch of questions uh, that I'm going to throw at Jim, so we'll chat for a bit um, and then we'll have time for a little bit of audience QA as well, um, should anyone have any questions. Um, so, we'll, we'll roll into that very soon. Um, what I want so, one of my idiot author friends in Ottawa, who will remain nameless, but he knows who he is, <laughs> said that I should open by challenging you to an arm wrestle. But because I'm not stupid... <laughs> oh no, man, I've blown out my right wrist with the, with the signing, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I look buff, but there's all these brittle bits. You know, so. so what you're saying is I could take you. Uh, don't left-handed. Um, I don't think so. No. Hey. <laughs> I didn't figure, we're not going to risk it, I think I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what my actual first question is going to be, um, when I was, I was doing my research for this interview, um, and uh, you said before that you got into science fiction and fantasy as a kid um, because you were given copies of Lord of the Rings, um, and if I'm not mistaken, this book, correct? Oh, that is exactly Absolutely correct. Adventures. Only it was only it was the it was the box set. But that's the one. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I mean, to me, that that's amazing because this this is my copy. Uh, so if you can't see it at the back, it's the Han Solo Adventures um, from way oh, back in the day. There we yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by by Brian Daly. And so that this is one of the first books that I read when I was first getting into science fiction and fantasy. Um, and so my the question I want to throw to you uh, to start off with is, at what point or is there a point where you get used to this, like going from being like you know a kid reading science fiction and fantasy at home to the you know, guest of honor at cons and, and like the Jim Butcher. Do you ever get used to that? Um, the the Jim Butcher. There's just, like, there's a bunch of Jim Butchers. There's like a jazz singer. There's a guy who keeps winning fishing tournaments because it comes up on my Google alerts. There's like a real estate agent and a mayor somewhere. There's lots of Jim Butchers. Don't worry about that. But um, the. I don't know if you ever get used to it as much as, as, as much as you just sort of become exhausted and numb. <laughs> and it just becomes a little bit harder to be, to be weirded out by it. Oh, okay. um, uh, uh, just because also as you do it, you sort of establish this, this public persona mm. of Famous Guy Jim. I'm not Famous Guy Jim like at home or at the grocery store. I'm only like Famous Guy Jim here at cons. And Famous Guy Jim is like charming and eloquent, and can, can speak concisely, uh, uh, and can function socially with other people successfully. Uh, 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 you know, because Famous Guy Jim's been doing this a while. He's, he's a vet. But regular me is just sort of, God, there's so many people here. <laughs> you know, and it's like, and, and I say that here, and I say that in Hall H at Comic-Con. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's, it, it, it feels that way to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you so much get used to it as, as you just get worn down, and, and you just like, well, like, I could... I could be wowed and, and have some drama over this, but I am so tired. <laughs> I was up till two in the morning drinking with other writers, and then I had to be up at eight. You know, I had to be at a panel at eight. You know, and there, there, there was there was no breakfast, and, and nor did I want any because of the other writers making me drink. <laughs> um, uh, so I mean, it just gets it just gets to be too exhausting to to acknowledge that anymore, and so it just becomes it's like I've got to conserve energy. Yes, this is normal. Just pretend this is normal. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more <laughs> So are you, st like, if it's become, you know, like, almost numb and, and, and normal, have you gotten to a point where, like, are you still able to be surprised at, at these sorts of events? Is, did anything catch you off guard? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but my bar has been set progressively higher of what catches me off guard, you know. So, uh, and, yeah, recently, uh, uh, Recent events have, have raised the bar to the point I don't think I'm going to be bothered by anything anymore. Previously, the, my, my bar was, uh, uh, it didn't really make me go, hmm, until you were like having a conversation with me, 
and you followed me into the bathroom <laughs> you know, while I was using the urinal to continue your conversation. That, way, that had been my previous bar, but it's, 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 it's higher now. So. <laughs> May I ask why? <laughs> oh, it's stuff I'd rather not talk about. Okay, no, that's fair. That's totally fair. Totally fair. Uh, okay, so, serious question. Okay. Um, and this comes from me as, as a reader and a huge fan of your work. Um, do you take some sort of gratuitous pleasure in pulling out our heartstrings and keeping us on the edge of our seat? Ah. Be honest. No. <laughs> um, it's not. It's it's not that. People accuse me of, of, of torturing my characters a lot, and uh, I would never say that. Uh, uh, and, and see, the thing is, is, is I'm, I'm not actually torturing my characters. I'm torturing all of you. <laughs> and I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I think if I made some different choices, I could have been a good supervillain. But uh, as it is, this is a lot easier, and I get to lay down while I work. So, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I want to talk uh, a couple of points about the Dresden Files, um, which is phenomenal. And, I, and the fact that you're sitting here, and I can say that to you personally. I just want to throw that out there. Right? <laughs> and yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to tell you the story of how these books started at some point. <laughs> oh, why, if you would like. Why? All right. Oh, well, go ahead. All right. Uh, this is how this is the glamorous beginnings of the Dresden Files. Um, uh, I got my, my my bachelor's degree in English literature, which with an emphasis in creative writing, which only set my career back three or four years. <laughs> um, but I had, uh, uh, but I had, I had started. I'd gone to graduate school in in uh, journalism in their professional writing program. Uh, where they had classes like, where they had classes like, how to write a genre fiction novel, and for the class, you wrote a novel, and you got graded on your novel at the end of the class, and the, the entire thing was just here. This is how you do all this stuff. Go, um, uh, and, and, and uh, the teacher's name was Debbie Chester. Uh, I think she's retired from teaching, but she's re recently published a book, uh, the, the 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 formula of fantasy fiction, uh, uh, and and it's a it's a book about writing craft, and so she was trying to teach me all these wonderful things about writing craft, and. Uh, I may be a little obstreperous occasionally when people are trying to tell me what to do, um, and uh, 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 so she kept giving me very, very, very good advice, and I kept ignoring her because, after all, I had a bachelor's degree in English literature with an emphasis in creative writing, and I was going to be a swords and horses fantasy writer. That's what I was going to do. I was going to write the next epic Lord of the Rings thingy uh, because I was sure that was that was that was my that was my destiny. And uh, uh, so I worked, I, I, I kept working on that, kept working on that, kept not getting anywhere. So she kept advising me, hey, you need to try some different genres, and you try some different things. Uh, even if you don't end up working there, trying it is going to, is going to give you a different feel and a different appreciation for the, for the craft of writing itself. And that's kind of what you need to focus on. So I'm like, uh, so at one point I finally went, okay, fine. And I'd written several books, and I, I finally, I, I wrote uh, this, this X-Files ripoff. And, uh, 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 and then... Uh, I finally, I mean, I, I just got sick of her giving me advice, you know, because she, she'd come up to me, she'd, like, she'd be like, Jim, you know, you're always talking about, uh, uh, you know, you're talking about this new show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a lot. You're talking about uh, uh, Laurel Hamilton's writing a lot. Maybe you should try something kind of in that, in that area, because you're always bringing it up in class. Uh, uh, or you're also, you bring up Babylon 5 a lot in class, and when we come to talking writing craft, and maybe you should try some science fiction. And, and, and I was like, but I'm a swords and horse fantasy author. No, but one semester I finally decided I was going to prove Debbie wrong. And the means I chose to do that was genius, because I was about 25 in college, and I thought I knew a lot. Um, so, I said, uh, 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 so I said to myself, okay, you know how you're going to do it? You're going to do everything she says. You're going to be her good little writing monkey. You're going to fill out all these little worksheets, and you're going to do, do her little stupid character building exercises, and you're going to do absolutely everything she says. And then at the end, she's going to see what utter cookie-cutter pablum crap emerges from that kind of process. And so I wrote the first book of the Dresden Files. <laughs> You know, which sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I still remember. I still remember walking into uh, uh, it was a, it was a it was a, a consult course. Uh, so I still remember walking in for my consult, and handing her the first couple chapters of the Dresden Files, and then being like, "Here." And she stops and she reads them. And you got to understand, Debbie is a teacher who does not believe in pulling punches because the industry does not pull punches. So when she's getting you ready to go out, she's not there to hold your hand. She's there to make you a better writer. Uh, uh, and and her critiques 
had included such things up to and including rolling up the chapters I'd written for her, leaning across the table, <laughs> popping me on the head with him and saying, what were you thinking? <laughs> That's the kind of teacher she was. She was tough, I mean, but she was fair. But she, she gets in reading these chapters and she goes, you did it. I said, what? She says, you did it, this will sell. Uh, I do not know if this will be the first thing you sell, but this is of professional quality, you will eventually be able to sell it. Uh, when you come back in next week, I want an outline for the rest. And she meant the rest of the book. <laughs> so I come rolling in the next week with an outline for a 20 book series. <laughs> book, and then a big, a big old, a big old honking, uh, thick, doorstoppy book trilogy at the end to kind of capstone the whole thing, you know, with, with, with all these villains and cross-plots, and it's like, I, I, I babbled about it for 20 minutes at her, and she sat there going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can see the look on her face now, it's the same look you get on your face when Wile E. Coyote is going off the cliff, <laughs> but before he's looked down, you know, you're just kind of waiting for that, and that's what she was doing, and so she's just sitting there, and and, and later she told me, yeah, there was no way I could tell you that you were just not going to be able to sell a 20-book series to an editor who's a brand new author. And I'm like, well, thank God you didn't tell me because I went and did it. <laughs> I mean, I, I had to do it in pieces, and we do it, you know, we, the, the, I think the first, the first contract was a three-book contract uh, because I already had the second one done, and uh, I was halfway through the third one, and they read the first one, they read the second one, and I, I guess they decided that I wasn't going to be a whole lot of work for them. And they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't be wasting much time on the new guys, so they were like, yeah, sure, we'll do three books. And, uh, and then we won't have to deal with new people for a while. And then the books took off, and, they, and, and, and even, even the editors at Rock were like, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, these are my dumb little wizard books that basically prove how arrogant I was. And, uh, 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 but, I mean, if you guys are having a good time, good. That's the, that's the idea. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Debbie was the teacher. Was your instructor's name? Do you still keep in touch? Um, uh, yeah, we swap email occasionally when she, when, when she published her, uh, uh, when she published her, her, her writing craft book, yeah. you know, she, she wrote me and said, hey, can I pay you to write an introduction? And I was like, no, you can't pay me to write an introduction. And so I wrote an introduction that was the story I just told you guys. Nice. And then I finished it with, in short, if somebody had told this to me uh, uh, three years earlier, I would be that much further ahead in my career. Shut up and do what Debbie tells you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's kind of the end. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, but, th that's, but that, that's how that, that series got started. <laughs> that's very cool. Um, so I've heard you say before like, in interviews about the Dresden Files, uh, or about your writing in general, that you don't think you can write romance. It's not that I can't write romance, it's that if I was a real mercenary writer, I would be writing romance. Okay. Fair and enough. I would have a girl's name and I would hire somebody to go to conventions for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because, ro well, romance is the, romance is the, is the money industry. I mean, if you want to make money as a writer, yeah. You know, I remember being, I remember being at one of the Romantic Times, uh, the Romantic Times convention, and um, somebody, somebody was talking to a bunch of panelists, and they, were, and they were sort of talking down to the romance writers. I mean, there was this kind of a little bit of condescension to yeah. it. It's like, why do you come to a romance convention and, and do that? She's like, well, and I have heard that romance writing is a cottage industry, and, and she's saying this to people, you know, to people with, with, with publishing lists 60 and 70 and, and 100 books long. But, but but I think it was uh, Nora Roberts that that, that 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 kind of kind of looked at and smiled very sweetly oh. and said, "Well, yes, I have a cottage in Scotland." I have a cottage in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, "Okay, Nora, you're awesome." <laughs> you know, so it's, at some point somebody was like, "Jim's in danger of becoming the Nora Roberts of, of fantasy," and I'm like, "Oh, if only I could be the Nora Roberts." <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh my god. Yeah. So I, like, the reason why I was thinking about this is because, to me, the relationship that, that develops between Harry and Murphy in, in your books is to, to me one of the most realistic, and, no, in all seriousness, yeah. one of the most realistic relationships I've ever seen in, in fiction. And so, like, how did that come about, like, the genesis of that incredibly long and arduous and heart-wrenching uh, for readers relationship? Like, how did that all come about? Um, uh, for Murphy, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing a character. Uh, you know, I'm writing this character, I'm writing Dresden. And, and uh, the first thing I, I write about him is I want him to be, a, he's, he's a wizard, he's a holdover from an older world, you know, I mean, I, I want him to be somebody who had uh, a little bit, a little bit more old-fashioned senses of chivalry and courtesy and so on, um, you know, when he bothers to show any. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, he's, he's dressed and he lips off to everyone. Um, but, uh, 
and I needed, you know, and, and as I was putting this character together, it's like, okay, I need, I need a foil for this character. So Dresden's, mm -hmm. Dresden's erratic, and you know, Dresden's sort of, sort of erratic and, uh, uh, and instinctual. Mm -hmm. And I wanted some, and I wanted someone across from him who was going, who was, who was going to be disciplined and orderly. Okay. You know, Dresden was, you know, basically everything that, that Harry is. Murphy's the opposite of, even physically. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Harry's tall. Harry's tall and skinny with the with the with the the, the dark hair, the dark eyes. And Murphy's Murphy's short and muscular with blonde hair and blue eyes. I mean, I, I just, it's it was I just made them opposites. It's basic romance craft, yeah, yeah. you know, that I, <laughs> that I was following. And uh, I mean, because I, I wasn't invested in this. I was doing it to prove a point. You know, I was I was trying to score points on my teacher, and uh, and 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 it just started writing it from there. And, and Murphy, you know, the first two books of the series, Murphy is not. Uh, a supporting character. She's a minor villain in both of those books because uh, all That's she does is idea. get in Harry's way, interfere with him, and make his life harder. Uh, uh, because her role in that, as 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 my writing was not as uh, I was not writing a companion character. I was writing a, a, an adversary, right, right, right. and there were adversaries who, who were not necessarily you know they don't they were not necessarily at each other's throats all the time. Uh, uh, but they were definitely they came at things from very different angles. And 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 from the writing craft perspective, she's a villain, right. uh, or she was until book three. Um, once it was it was the Walmart scene that changed everything for Murphy. Or no, that was book four, and and, and it was the Walmart scene that changed everything for Murphy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, because then she kind of got right in the face all the things that Dresden is dealing with. You know, uh, well, uh, well, she got she got really screwed up in the third book, uh, uh, and then by the time she recovered from that, she was like, oh, there's this whole world of badness that I don't know anything about, and he does. I probably better start mining him for information and treating him like like an ally instead of somebody who's occasionally a pain in my ass. Right, right, right. You know, so. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's that's where she came from, and then uh, and then the romance sort of grew. Uh, I, I mean, originally I had I had Harry set up with Susan, mm -hmm. and then I realized I'd created Lois Lane. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh well, I can't create Lois Lane because he'll just be rescuing her for twenty books, and that's no good. So I was, I was like, okay, we got to do something else with her. All right, we can do the vampire thing. That's cool because then she'll be kind of half a superhero yeah. and can hang with him. And it's like, oh, but yeah, kind of the way I've written this, yeah, that's not going to work either. <laughs> but poor Susan. <laughs> I was I, I was the worst to her. But, yeah, 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 I was the worst. Not that I thought. So how often, like, when you're going through your writing process, how often does that happen? When you reach a moment when you're like, oh crap, I shouldn't have done this, or oh crap, I can't do that now, and yet, like, because what I like, your your dressing file seems to be very free of inconsistencies. Yes, that I don't that I don't take credit for that. Uh, okay. That's my beta readers helping me. I've got one beta reader who is um, just freakishly good at, 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 at story consistency. Okay. Uh, like to the point where, where she's got the entire, the entire thing on a database and she can just go do a, a word oh, search like, you know, for things and be able to say, nope, in this book, in this chapter, on this page, this yeah. is what you said. And I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very frustrating because, uh, because of the way my process works. Um, sure. um, when I'm writing, uh, I don't sit down and actually start writing a chapter until I can visualize the whole thing in my head. Once I can okay. see the whole thing in my head and I sit down and write it, it comes out nice and easy. There's, it's, editing is very light, um, uh, uh, and because uh, uh, I kind of front load the process. Right, the okay. downside of that is is that when is that when uh, uh, one of the beta readers comes up with something like uh, you comes up with something like here you missed this little detail, which kind of invalidates this entire thing, you know, this entire point, and then I'll have to be. <laughs> and then go start the process over again, and then you know, three weeks later, it's like, okay, try this one. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a book done here, people. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's... okay. Um, yeah, I want to stick with Harry Murphy for just one other second. I, I'm going to phrase this very carefully, just in case people aren't caught up on uh, to the end of Skin Games. I'm going to phrase this as carefully as I can, just in case. Um, do you like with their relationship? Do you see that now as something that will make the winter mantle harder or easier for Harry to bear? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't answer questions like that. Um, um, although, 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 man, let me just take a step back and kind of widen the picture a little sure. and sort of look at Harry's life. When has it gotten easier? <laughs> and well, at what point in the series did things get easier? Well, there was the time. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, right. life never really gets easier. I mean, you 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 you, you got to keep challenging yourself. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, if it, if it did, we would all get terribly bored. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, my question of, do you see there being a cost for Murphy to stand by him? I probably already know the answer. To that. What? <laughs> yeah, okay. Really? Do you? <laughs> uh, um, 
we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. I'm pretty sure I know what happens, but we'll see. Uh, uh, sometimes things happen while I'm writing, and there's several points in the series that I built big decisions for the character in uh, that I then went, um, okay, I don't know what he's going to choose. I won't know until he gets there because mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of different factors that go into There's a lot of factors that go into any choice that anybody makes. Right, for sure. And, uh, 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 and, and so, you know, I wasn't, sure what, I wasn't sure which choice he would make when he got to that point. So there's a slightly di there's a different version of the Dresden Files, and, and, and one of the big ones was in uh, Deadbeat, mm -hmm. uh, when he's deciding uh, how he's going to go take on the big bad guys at the end. And he winds up, uh, uh, he winds up grabbing the word of Kemmler and reanimating the, uh, the dinosaur and mm -hmm. going to town on him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, 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 but there were, but he also, uh, or yeah, there were there were three there were three things he could have done there. He could he could have gone with the word of Camlar. He could have gone. No, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking too far too far back. It was in changes that he made the, the really huge one. Uh, changes was like this giant gamble for me because there were all these things that I didn't know what was going to happen when I was writing it, and I didn't know how it was going to fall out afterwards. So in changes, you know, he's 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 against the wall. His back's broke. His daughter's going to die. It's going to kill him too, and and other people around him. And uh, uh, so he's got to make, he's got to do something he hasn't done before. He's got to change his boundaries. Mm. And so he's got three choices. He can pick up the word of Kemmler and go full on necromancer and go against the, and go against the, the vampires like that. Mm. He can pick up, he can summon uh, Lashiel's coin to him still. Right. He can still find that. Yeah. And at which point he goes in as a, as a, as a Denarian knight and takes them on. And then the, the, his third choice was Mab. Right. Uh, uh, was to go, it was, it was to take Mab's offer and take her power and go. And because Mab keeps her word, he says, okay, I'm going to set this up to where I can, to where I'll be able to go in and at least I can save her, mm -hmm. but I, I, I won't be able to save me. I'm already done. Right, okay. You know, so, I mean, that was his, you know, that was, that was his thinking. That was why he went, that was why he went with Mav at the time. Right, okay. Because he was in a place of just such, such despair. And then his biggest concern was, but what if she makes me into a monster and has me kill people? So he, so he figures, he figures out a contingency for that as well. Mm -hmm. And then he goes in, and, and you know, hopefully he can't lose. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, either way, he won't wind up a monster, and hopefully he'll be able to get his to get his daughter out, mm -hmm. uh, and to her mother, and, and safe in a way. Right. You know, that was his plan. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but there were these huge big choices, and then there were different versions of the Dresden Files for Harry the Necromancer, Harry the Denarian. You know, once once Nicodemus becomes your regular frenemy, you yeah. know that's. I mean, that would have been an interesting series, but it would have gotten a lot dark. And the necromancy thing would have. I don't. I don't even know about that. That could have, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, because Harry would have. Because that would have meant that he was all. Oh no, he would have tried to pretend I'm just a regular wizard all the time. But the necromancy would have kept cropping up and getting more serious, and you know. Yeah. Uh, no doubt. Yeah, that would have been. But but on the other hand, he could also he uh, then he could be like the the white necromancer and be and be raising the spirits of the advantage, which he actually did in book three. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but anyway, so it, it's, but it's, it's, it, when you but when you write these things, you're not really sure what's going to happen. And, and I, I, I knew I was taking major chances and changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and oh my God, the editor, my editor called me after she got to the, the last page of the manuscript. Like apparently it was still on her desk and had not been flipped over onto the stack. Oh, no. The last page, and she calls me up. She's like, "You killed him! You killed him!" <laughs> <laughs> and my response was, "Yeah, now we can do the really fun stuff." <laughs> And, and, and she just kind of stops for like a good five seconds and goes, okay. <laughs> and that was the conversation. You know, like, Calm the editor down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of, of gambles and, and taking chances on stuff, when I read um, Aeronaut's Windlass, which is also phenomenal, if uh, anybody's read Aeronaut's Windlass, um, what struck me immediately was that like, it, it's a very different writing style than the Dresden Files. And so when, when you wrote that and, and when it was released, were you worried that fans wouldn't follow you, that they, they wouldn't buy into such a different story? Um, I knew they wouldn't. Not all of them. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but I was trying to write something, and, and I had, okay, I finished the, the, the Codex Alera and the Spider-Man book for Marvel, and, and so I was trying to decide, what am I going to do for my next side project? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so I wrote uh, the first quarter or third of four different novels and showed it to my beta readers. Okay. And then I and then I talked to them and like, okay, well which ones, you know, you know, which one do you think do you did you enjoy the most? Which one do you like the best? So uh, I mean there was my uh, Men in Black meets X-Men on the Moon uh, 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 science fiction. Um, nice. That was fun. It's, it's 200 years in the future, and everybody who lives out in the who lives out uh, uh, in the in the orbital stations and on the moon uh, uh, got kind of sick of paying taxes to people back on Earth who have no idea the kind of problems they have and what yeah. they're dealing with. 
And eventually they took a power satellite and wrote, don't tread on me in 30 meter letters across the Gobi that Desert. <laughs> and withdrew, you know, from, from Earth and formed the United System. That's what they call themselves, the United System. And I made up that entire story just so I could call the peace officers the U.S. Marshals. Oh my God. <laughs> and so it's the U.S. Marshals is the name of the series. I love it. And, uh, uh, and they're the only ones who know about the aliens. Uh, uh, so, you know, because... Uh, the alien society in general, they've outlawed contact with, with uh, less developed societies, and, you know, so when contact is outlawed, only the outlaws will make contact, and, <laughs> and, so, and so the only aliens we see are, like, political refugees, religious nutsos, teenagers that are out eviscerating cows for fun, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it, that is the only aliens we get, and then it's the marshal's job to deal with them quietly, you know, and so, uh, uh, and, that, and that was, I, I wrote that, and I think I left it with my protagonist, having ejected from his ship, whose, whose, whose core was about to explode, was damaged, about to explode, um, in a decaying orbit over the moon with a solar flare coming on. And, and wow. he's been there for like 12 years. I don't know, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, he just left him in limbo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, well, I mean, I, I, I didn't decide to go with that book. I mean, I might go back to it later. Um, but, uh, uh, and then the second book was uh, sort of a... Uh, uh, Gunsmoke meets uh, The Black Company. Uh, and it was a it was a, it was a it was a fantasy book, and it was set after the epic fantasy war, when basically not only the good guys hadn't won, and the bad guys hadn't won, and the war had sort of collapsed under its own weight, and and everybody was just trying to figure out how to rebuild, and and and, and it was set around a castle, and the idea was uh, we're going to have these characters who are building this castle, we're gonna, and I'm going to kind of show what life in a medieval castle was like, and have awesome fantasy action adventure, you know, and that was that was well, that was my goal. Uh, uh, so that one and that one wasn't wasn't very well received because it was very black company. Um, and that's not and that's not a, that's not a series that is for everybody. No, and sure. um, uh, and then I wrote uh, 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 the Aeronauts Windless mm -hmm. and got an explosive response on the Aeronauts mm -hmm. Windless. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, probably because there's a talking cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was cheap. I, I, I like to think that I'm a mercenary writer. I like to think that I'm that I'm, that I'm very sensible and rational about the things that I pick, and that I don't I don't pick things for like emotional reasons and so on. So when I was right, getting ready to write the Aeronauts Windless, uh, I knew I was going to have a, kind of a very Victorian feel, and so I, I, I wanted it to also have to also kind of be more R-rated, you know, R-rated because you know it's Victorians were kinky lot. They really were, you know. So uh, I, I kind of wanted to build that into the series, and, I, and also I thought and sex sells, so that's great. And yeah. then I, I, I was, I was, as I was getting down and, and kind of outlining and started writing, I said, but you know what sells more than sex? Animals. <laughs> <laughs> Especially talking animals. Yeah, yeah that's got to be done. And so, uh, and so I, I swapped out sex for talking cats. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, made my job a whole lot harder. Sex is easy to write. Oh my god, it's, it's, it's sex scenes are like action scenes. They're pretty simple. Oh, yeah. They're straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> so, so between the, <laughs> between the three series, um, in terms of like writing scenes, what's the hardest scene that you had to write? If you had to pick one off the top of your head. Mm. Uh. It's almost always the ones when I torture Molly. Uh, uh, oh, oh wow, there was like a yeah, it was it was it was doing that to Molly at the end of Cold Days, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. getting her stuck with that, and then uh, 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 and it's also it's it's, it's occasionally difficult. I've, I've written a couple of short stories from her point of view now, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you know she's got she's got kind of a tough road she's walking at the moment. Yeah, so. a little bit. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, just a um, does that sort of thing, like as a writer, like after you write a scene like that, does that sit with you for a while? Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the first time I wrote a scene that really disturbed me was uh, in Full Moon, and I wrote the, this slaughter in the police station. Oh yeah. And I'd actually gone and visited the police station, uh, the oh. local police station, and kind of looked around and, and told them what I was doing. I'm researching, there's a werewolf loose. And, and, and they're like, okay, well here's the, kind of, here's the kind of response you could sort of expect from that sort of thing if there's a problem with the prisoner. And, and, and I think a werewolf might be a little bit larger than our average prisoner problem, and I'm, I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> but having written that, and, and because you know, I had to write this creature who was merciless and bloodthirsty and a bunch of things that I wasn't, and, uh, 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 and yet you know, and I had to show these people suffering and dying, right. and, and also kind of show the horror of it happening because Harry had picked like, exactly the wrong potion to go into there, into the, the police station under. Of course. Uh, look, trying to look normal, like you, you're trying to look gray and boring. You know, so that people wouldn't notice him, and he's, he's sitting there trying to shout a warning that the, 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 the werewolf's coming, and they can't hear him because of his own potion. 
It's like, that is just a nightmare scenario. But I got done writing that, and, and I, was just, I just remember just kind of sitting there at the keyboard. <laughs> like this, and then it's like, I want some ice cream. <laughs> and then I want to go curl up around my kid. <laughs> yeah. I probably shouldn't be near my kid for a little while. I want some ice cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you've got to throw yourself into into the scenes of what you're doing, you gotta invest it, you know, you gotta invest your own emotion into it. Because if you don't, if you don't care, uh, uh, they won't care either. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, you said, so I was watching a bunch of your previous panels over the last couple of years to kind of, you know, research and, and not ask you a ton of questions you've been asked before. Um, and so you were, uh, you were on a panel uh, talking about villains, I think at, at Salt Lake Comic Con recently. Okay. Um, and you were saying that your definition of a villain is that the villain has something missing that should be there. Oh, um, I would say, it is what I said. You can walk it back. It's okay. uh, no, it's not that I want to walk it back. So I want to provide context. Oh, what? Um, it, it, it's, 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 it, that was a description for villains, but it's a, it's a description of evil in the world in general. Oh, okay. I mean, I think evil is a real thing. You don't really run into it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, you run into stupid a whole lot more than run into evil in the real world. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's okay. Um, uh, genuine evil, it's hard. But I mean, if you go talk to people who, have to, who are responsible for dealing with that kind of thing, they'll look at you and tell you, yeah. I mean, there's lots of guys that I'll get, and they're just bad folks. And, you know, for whatever reason, they enjoy hurting other people or whatever. And that's just the normal riffraff run of the mill. But occasionally, you run into something that is deeply weird. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you look at it and you go, nope, that is evil right there. I can see it. Okay. And, 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 and for those folks, and, 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 you know, just thinking about it, it's like that's what really, that's what really drives the, the truly evil. When you talk about sociopaths and psychopaths, there's something that's missing there. I mean, okay. and, 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 and not everyone goes that way. Most sociopaths, are, you know, they get along just fine in society. Okay. Uh, um, but, but occasionally there's real evil there, and I think that's driven by something that is inside, that there's an empty space in there yeah. somewhere that they're trying to fill, and they don't know how to fill it. Okay. Uh, and that's, why, that's what drives them to do the things they do. It's almost like, like, almost like a soul. Like, I don't know if I wanted to use that term. But. Uh, there's a, I, don't, I don't know if I would go with a soul, yeah. but there's, there's a need somewhere in there. Uh, uh, that they need to fill, okay. and I don't know what that is. But and, and that's how, and that, now that's how I build my villains. When okay. I'm when I'm, I'm creating these people, it's like they have a need that they have this hole that they have to fill that is bottomless, but they keep having to try to fill it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, that's you know that's the way that, that's the way it works when people actually go bad like that. Now for monsters, you can just have monsters be like, I just like the way you taste. Right. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but 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 you know when you're but when you're dealing when you're when you're when you're building the character and you, yeah, yeah. You, when you build a character, you almost have to build a human or something that is human related because that's all we have to talk to. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's how, I, that's how I build my villains. Okay. Uh, I know there's something in them that they, and I, and I try and figure out what it is, but I, I don't get it because apparently I don't do it. I don't know. Oh, okay. So I, 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 I'm, I'm making my best approximation. You know, yeah, I, that's no, what I have to yeah. do. I have to make my best approximation for all kinds of things. Right. Oh my God, I'm such a liar. That's <laughs> People ask me what I do for a living and I say I tell long, complicated lies. Yeah. Yeah, storytellers are liars. Yeah, I mean, that, charlatans and it is. It is. It, well, and 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 really, you know, I mean, everybody's got a gift, and yeah. my gift happens to be uh, being able to sucker people into letting their emotions ride along on this this line of thought. Wow. Now, you can be a, you can do you can you can have that gift to be a grifter, uh, 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 or you can have that great gift to be like a writer or a stage musician, musician or something or a magician or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you, you can turn whatever whatever gift whatever your gift is, no matter how. Uh, uh, dark you might think it is, you can probably turn it to something good. Okay. It's just a matter of it's a matter of, of it's a matter of focus and will and creativity. Right, right, right. I like, so we're, we're benevolent charlatans. What you're saying? Uh, more or less, we're, we're getting paid. So no, I don't know how benevolent we are, but uh, uh, but at least we're trying not to hurt anybody while we're getting paid. <laughs> no, really, really, all these words right here. Ten dollars, and they can be yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> Oh, I, I like that. that I, I mean, I like man, that. That, is a, that is a tough enterprise. That's a tough business to get off the ground, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Yeah, for me, for me it was 10 years. Oh. Uh, it was 10 years before I made a dollar. And uh, then it was another 10 years before I broke minimum wage. Oh, my God. Yeah. And look at you now. Yeah, weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, so I'm going to, uh, one thing I like to do in my interviews, which I maybe sort of stole from Larry King now. Larry, I hope you're not watching. Uh, is I, I throw very rapid fire questions at, at uh, my, my guest. Um, and first thing the pop so prep yourself. Okay. Okay. Once I've done that, we'll have some time for a uh, little bit of audience Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, think of them now. Um, you've got a couple of minutes. Okay. So are you ready? Let's go. Okay. I'm going to move this sheet over here so you don't cheat. Okay. Um, are there enough hours in a day? No. Okay. 
Favorite Star Wars film? Uh, original. Star Wars. Oh, the okay, okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confused with that for a second. <laughs> Am I prepared is the question. No. Um, best no. part of being a writer? Um, I can go to work in my pajamas. Okay. Worst part of being a writer? Um, I, 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 I'm like this crazy hermit shut-in most of the time. Oh, okay. You know, so, you know, really, that's what my job is, is being alone in a room and, and playing D&D with myself, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and writing it down. Uh, favorite D&D class? Oh. Don't think about it too long. Yeah, you're right. Wizard. Okay. <laughs> Wizard, the uh, wizard, followed by paladin, followed by fighter. Okay, I was gonna say, like, is that the honest answer, or is that the I'm out of client answer? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's just that it's. I don't like to play. I don't really like to play wizards anymore because I, I it's too much like work. Okay. <laughs> I mean, when I play D and D, it's like I play the biggest, dumbest fighter you can possibly find. And just, it, 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 that, that thing with Dresden, it's me. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Um, who would win in a fight, Murphy or Captain Grimm? Murphy. Okay. Why? Uh, because Grimm would never hurt a woman like that. Oh, all right, fair enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, Grimm, Grimm's instincts would be all, nope, don't hurt her, and yeah. then she'd cling him up because, <laughs> because he didn't respect him. <laughs> fair enough. Um, uh, a fandom that you would love to write for but haven't yet? Uh, uh, David, uh, David Weber's uh, uh, Harrington mm. uh, series. Nice. Um, something you've never written and don't think that you could pull off? Um, true crime. Oh, okay. Um, Let's see, true crime, I don't think I'd pull that off. And straight mystery, I don't know if I could do that. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Um, an author that you go to for advice. <laughs> Besides Nora Roberts. Uh, of course. <laughs> no, I don't, no I, don't, I, don't, I don't go to writers for advice, I just, I just watch them. Oh, okay. And then, and then try and emulate them, you know? I mean, it, it, I, I'll go read their work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I wanted to improve my, my humor writing. Okay. So it's like, well, who's good at humor? Terry Pratt's is good at humor. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, go read Pratt until you figure out how he does it, and then you keep reading. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and and, 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 and when you, if you read Pratt long enough and you analyze his Pratt, you can be like, oh, here's how he sets up jokes. Here's, here's, here's how he delivers those zingers, you know, like that. And it's like, okay, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, new or, uh, speaking of reading, new or up-and-coming author that, that you're into and you think is awesome. Oh, um, I like uh, Brian McClellan and the Powder Mage series. Oh my yes. god, right? Uh -huh. They're I very good. Since Vampire, like, <laughs> They're really very, I mean, if, if you enjoy oh, uh, Sanderson's Mistborn, you will love McClellan's Powder Mage. Yeah. It's uh, very much the same thing where he sets up a magic system that is, uh, uh, it's, it's very, very, it's, it's almost ridiculously simple on its surface, and then it gets incredibly complex and wild as, as, as you go, totally, because totally. People, get, people get creative with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal. We, uh, we could turn in about that, but we won't. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, don't read it. You can also check out uh, Benedict Jacket. Uh, Benedict oh, Jacket yes. writes a series, uh, a wizard series called uh, Alex, uh, the Alex Virus novels. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's a wonderful guy. His series is really good. His wizard is one of the more creative and awesome ones I've seen. Nice. Awesome. That's high praise. Um, is the Brazilian witch doctor story true? The Brazilian witch doctor story is true. Okay. 100%? Uh, yes. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, all of it. <laughs> Um, and then uh, the last uh, for this rapid fire, uh, one piece of writing advice to leave our audience with. Um, once you've finished one story, don't just keep on it. Go to the next story. It's going to teach you more. Mm, I like that. Very good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay. I, I saw that hand over there first. So you should. Uh, I'm going to repeat it just for the camera and, and for everyone else in the audience. <coughs> Um, and then we'll turn it to Jim. So, in the Dress and Files, we see that a lot of the different wizards have their own styles of magic. How much is the way magic works individual to the wizard versus how much is it a function of the magic itself? Okay, so the question was, uh, how much is an individual wizard's uh, style uh, tailored to them? Um, and, so and, and, magic. And, and, and to, yeah, magic itself. One of the models I used um, for understanding how magic works uh, was martial arts, um, because they're both an expression. They're both expressions of power that that not all people have. Okay, and so I figured that's that's a reasonably good parallel to work with. I'll start drawing influence from that. So when you talk about martial artists, um, it, there's all these conversations. I remember having this conversation uh, 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 with some people. Uh, my, my very first real serious exposure to martial arts was the Karate Kid, of course. Uh, uh, and then, and then I, I went to a Ryukyu Kempo school and, and, and learned from a, a, a guy who was, um, he was my teacher and he was, he was 
getting his English doctorate at UMKC, and he was living in a basement karate, uh, karate studio, and he had like a little closet where he kept his room. Uh, and, and he was about, he was about a 40-year-old uh, uh, Japanese guy named uh, Shiro Shintaku. Mm. And uh, uh, Mr. Shintaku, uh, uh, you know, he was my teacher, he was a really good guy. Uh, uh, but what I didn't know is that he was from an old Japanese family. And when I say an old Japanese family, I mean he has a direct ancestor in the tale of Genji. Oh my god. <gasps> yeah, yeah. His, uh, I, I saw pictures of him in, in the middle of a five million dollar Shinto wedding on top of a New York skyscraper uh, about ten years ago. Wow. <laughs> you know, ten or twelve years ago. I mean, he's from that kind of family. He was living in complete poverty in this yeah. little place because uh, his teacher, Mr. Master Oyata, uh, who lived in Independence, uh, okay. uh, he was like an old school true guy, uh, martial artist. Okay. Um, and, and he was, uh, 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 you know, he had said, all right, well, you know what, if you want to come learn from me, you are welcome here, but your family's money isn't. If you want to come learn from me, you're going to live in my school, you're going to teach for your rent, uh, uh, you, you know, you're going you're to teach for your rent, and I'll pay you enough for food, and, uh, 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 but that's all you can have here. There's not going to be any cars, there's not going to be any suits, you can get your stuff from a secondhand store. Okay. And you can live. You can. You, you, you need. You need. To, you need to get away from that if you want to learn what I have to teach you. Right. And so he did. Wow. And and this is my, uh, Mr. Shintaku. Uh, I mean, I saw his six Dan black belt test. Uh, they shot three arrows at him. At him, not past him. At him. Oh <laughs> Two of them had red feathers. One of them had blue. He had to. He had to. He had to deflect the red ones and catch the blue one. And he didn't know what color they were because the because Master Yada held the held the feathers behind his hand like that, and he didn't know what color they were until he released them. And he was about fifty feet away. He had he had less than a quarter of a second to do it, and he did it. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah that was that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in real life. But back to the question. <laughs> um, so martial arts. When you're having conversations about martial arts, um, uh, uh, people will say, "Well, what's the best martial art?" Well. There's no best martial art because you know. Uh, I mean, if you if you are if you are a long, tall, skinny, quick guy, man, Taekwondo is for you. That is a great art for you. Maybe crane style kung fu, you'd be super well suited to that. Maybe not so much wrestling. You know, maybe not so much jujitsu. Um, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, uh, you know, some some of the other uh, some of the other arts that rely. You maybe not so much boxing. Um, it's going to depend on who you are and 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 what you can do and the kind of resources you have that you, you were just given. Uh, uh, which martial art is the best martial art? For wizards, magic's the same way. You know, Harry is good at, he's very good at very direct magic. Um, and he's very good at magic that takes a lot of time and love and investment to, to build. You know, I mean, I mean his, you know, his, his, his gadgets that he makes for himself are second to none in the wizard world, even though he's a punk kid. Um, uh, he can blow, I mean, he can blow things up as well as some of the, as some of the, the, heavy, the heaviest hitting wizards around. But he sucks at a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, and so, as a wizard, and you find out that you that there's some things you're going to be very good at, some things you aren't going to be good at. And if you if you want to be a serious wizard and be seriously skilled with your magic and with exp expressing that power, you've got to find one that matches what you can do. So, uh, uh, so, and so that's why everybody's style is slightly different. And all wizards, I try and build them. Okay, well, here's somebody who this this guy's practical. This guy's romantic about the old days. This guy is 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 completely focused on the self discipline that that comes with not needing any magical accoutrements, you know, to go along with what you do. And and so that's you know that that's why they're all different though. Uh, magic isn't just vanilla. I mean, it's it, it, it's based on who and what you are, and it's an expression of what you believe as well, which also affects it. Best panel answer ever. Me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, behind you. Sorry, I'll come to you. You mentioned beta readers, and so what do you feel are some of the upsides uh, and downsides of beta of using beta readers? So upsides and downsides of beta readers. Um, to, this is again. This is going to be different from from author to author because writing is like magic. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I feel there are no downsides, and the upsides are so massive that they cannot be ignored. Um, the way I write is I write a chapter at a time, send it to the beta readers, and get their response. And the response is a, is a three field questionnaire on a website that says, "What did you like about this chapter? What didn't you like? Is there anything you didn't understand, or did you have any questions?" And, and that, and that, and then being able to look at those answers and the what people say back to me let, lets me re, lets lets me um, diagnose what's wrong with the chapter. You know, they're my they're my audience, or they're they're my lab rat. And uh, well, you guys are kind of my lab rats too. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but 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 you know, when when I get their answers from them, then I know if they're asking questions. Well, I haven't I haven't established this storyline clearly enough. 
if this seems out of character, out, out of character for this for, for a given character, you know, they say this is out of character for them. And I have to think, well, is that right, or is there something I need to do? I need to plant ahead of time to make sure that that comes that comes true later on. And and it's also and, and, and I can't catch everything, especially not as the books get longer and longer. You know, I, I need more and more help to keep everything straight if I'm going to maintain the quality. So, uh, uh, I, I mean, that's that's the last thing I want to happen. I, I, I don't want the Dresden Files to be something that I just go, ah, right there, you yeah. know, like that. I, I don't want that. Um, and, and it's the beta readers that help me not drive myself crazy. Uh, How so many do you have? There are currently 14 on the list. Oh, wow. Um, uh, uh, and some of them been, have been there for a long time, and, you know, since the first book, and some of them are, you know, are new. Uh, I generally lose a couple people every year, and I got this waiting. I got a big waiting list of, of people that that they, when I lose somebody, I'll go to the waiting list. So I need a, a beta reader. Okay, are, are you up? Yeah, okay, you can do this. Cool. Um, but anyway, so uh, but, but yeah, that's beta readers are amazing uh, because if you're doing it without them, then you're writing in a vacuum, and you're just sort of you're you're, you're sort of writing blind and throwing it out there, and then going, I hope someone likes it, and. <laughs> While there are some people who write like that, I just think it's smarter to go, instead of doing that, to go, hey guys, what do you think about this? Maybe I should fix that. Okay, what do you think about it now? How about now? You know, like that. And, uh, it gets, you get to a point where rewriting becomes counterproductive, but uh, uh, um, it's, it's definitely worth it uh, to, be able to, to be able to get some feedback. Um, and that way you can adjust what you're doing as you go. I sort of question. And I'll, I'll try. I'll get as many people as I can. I promise. So you gave us a brief overview of how you came up with the ideas behind Dresden Files and um, Cinder Spires. Can you do the same for Codex Alera? <laughs> uh, in 1998, 1999, uh, Delray started the Delray Online Writing Workshop uh, for aspiring writers. And basically, what it was, it was, it was a website, and uh, uh, you could go. There was a forum, and you could go there, and you could and you could have discussions with uh, with other aspiring writers. And occasionally an editor or an, agent or, or an author would come by and say, hello, and, and, and talk to us about writing but until we scared them all. Because, um, <laughs> I mean, d d d d how many people here are aspiring writers? Oh, yeah. yeah, you know how you are when you start talking about your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, anyway, so uh, we're on that. And it was, there was always a lot of discussion going back and forth. And, and, you know, I hadn't gotten published yet. Nobody else had ever gotten published yet. And uh, there came a discussion that was about, about writing craft, and it was... There, there were a couple of big competing ideas, and there, and there were two, two major sides and, and a lot of fury. It was one of those discussions where you hit the reply button and then caps lock and then you start typing. You know, like, like, one of those. Anyway, uh, so on one side of the discussion, they were saying what was the idea was this notion of the holy idea. They were calling it the holy idea with capital letters. Uh, uh, and that it, the, idea, the, the idea there is, is that if your idea is good enough, you can be a terrible writer and it'll still sell like gangbusters. And, and their example was, look at Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know, genetically resurrecting dinosaurs. That couldn't have missed. <laughs> like that. And the other side of the argument was, uh, uh, was the idea of writer craft and creativity. That that was what really sold books. That you could have the, that you could have the oldest, tiredest, most worn out idea in the world. And if you are a good and creative enough writer, you can put a spin on it to make people enjoy it again. Mm. Um, how many versions of Romeo and Juliet have we seen? And, and, and so I, I, was leading the, I was leading this side, the writer side, and then there was somebody else, there was some, other, there was some loud mouth leading the, <laughs> <laughs> leading the idea side. And we went back and forth for a couple of weeks. And finally this guy says to me, all right, put your money where your mouth is. Let me give you some tired, worn out, terrible ideas, and let's see you make something that sells out of them. And I said, you know, being who I was at the time, <laughs> nah, you know what, I tell you what, why don't you give me two terrible ideas, I'll use them both. <laughs> I might have been a little cocky at one time. <laughs> and uh, so the guy, so the guy, the guy says, "All right, fine, we'll do it." And every, like this is like in front of the audience. All right, we'll do it. First, first terrible idea is the Lost Roman Legion. I am so sick of Lost Roman Legion stories that all Lost Roman Legion should have been found by now. So it's Lost Roman Legion. That's the first terrible idea. I say, "Okay, Lost Roman Legion." What's the second terrible idea? And he says, "Pokemon." <laughs> So I said, got it. <laughs> okay, now this tells you something about this guy that, and this was the first year Pokemon to come out on television. Uh, 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 and, and it tells you something about this guy that he thought Pokemon was a terrible idea. <laughs> All right, and so I took this and I went, okay, I've got Lost Roman Legion Pokemon, so I went and started investigating them. Lost Roman Legion, normally they're talking about the Ninth Hibernian Legion. Uh, it's, a, it's a legion that marched north of the wall in, in England to deal with the Scots and never came home. Now, 
uh, uh, they, they, they apparently they marched north into a thunderstorm and were never seen again, and that was, that was how the Romans told the story. Uh, uh, I suspect what happened is that the Scots did not welcome them warmly. <laughs> the other option is that the Scots welcomed welcome them very warmly. <laughs> it's hard to tell with the Scots. <laughs> we're very tricky. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but, but anyway, but, but I said, okay, well, you know what? Let's say they marched off into a thunderstorm, they went somewhere else. Where did they go? Land of the Pokemon. All right, good. <laughs> so I said, let's look at Pokemon. Let's break down that idea. And the idea of Pokemon is itself a, a two-idea fusion. Um, first of all, it, it embraces uh, 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 the idea of kami in the Shinto religion. Uh, the Shinto believe that every natural uh, Shinto religion believes that every natural uh, um, uh, uh, formation, every natural thing, rivers, mountains, trees, stones, they all have a spirit within them called the kami. That's, that's part of the divine, the, the divine cosmos, um, and that you need to be, you need to be aware of those spirits and show respect to them. Um, you know, if there's a mountain, the mountain has a big damn spirit in it, and you better show respect. Pebbles got a, a spirit in it that's just as divine, but if you don't respect it. It's kind of a pebble in a tiny spirit. What, what's it going to do? Um, so, uh, 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 and then they, they took that idea, the idea of kami, and then they fused it with professional wrestling. And, and that, was where, that was where Pokemon came from. So I said, all right. So let's have the Romans, I, I, but i got to have a name for them. I can't call them Pokemon. i gotta, I got to come up with something. In the background, I had big trouble with Little China on because that's what I watch when I'm working on things uh, many times. And uh, I just got to the part where Egg Chen says, all movement in the universe is caused by tension between positive and negative furies. And I was like, ooh, furies. <laughs> it's even Greco-Roman. You know, it's like, I will take that word. That's what the, that is absolutely what the Romans would have named those things. And, and, so, and so I had the Romans march over there, and I, and I looked at the, the composition of Roman legions. Roman legions, it's tough to, it's really, it's tough to imagine a, a tougher or more flexible colonizing unit than a Roman legion. They were built to go wherever they, wherever, where, to wherever they could walk, they could go there and build Rome. That's what, that's, that's what the Roman legions did. Uh, because it was good to keep them busy building things instead of overthrowing emperors. Um, <laughs> And, uh, 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 and, and so, and then, and then the legions were, uh, they were about half Roman citizens, uh, about half German mercenaries, uh, and, then, and then they would have about double that size in camp followers and wives, which the legionnaires were legally not allowed to have, <laughs> which they had anyway, because you can't tell humans that. <laughs> um, uh, 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 and so I said, okay, so this group, they marches off, they, you know, they march off, and they would, they would be carrying all their own tools and equipment, they would be carrying uh, uh, smithing, uh, you know, you know, the equivalent of a, full, of a full smithy and other things with them. They could go somewhere and start building things, and so they did. They went to the land of Pokemon, and they, and they started, and they did what Romans did. They conquered and colonized, and they, they murdered a bunch of other sentient people that were there. Also, kind of what Romans did. I mean, they were, and, but they were they were outnumbered with their back against the wall, and so they they reverted to you know they kind of reverted to what they did. They they fought, and uh, so I gave them about a thousand years to form a society, and they got through that they got through that that rough first part where they basically turned themselves into like this Kali death cult for a long time. Um, uh, uh, and then, and then, eventually, the first emperor showed up and said, "All right, that's enough of this nonsense. We're going to have a civilization." And busted enough heads to make it happen. And uh, uh, and then they, I gave them another thousand years to put their civilization together. And then I started. And then I started it on a farm with a farm boy who was a prince, because that's where fantasy stories start. <laughs> I did not make that rule. <laughs> but um, uh, but anyway, that, that's where it came from. And then I, and then I went back online. <laughs> this guy, and I, and I got a bit in, and I went back online to this guy, and I'm like, you know what? Um, we're st you know, the, the internet was still pretty new. We weren't really sure how publishing on the internet was going to interact with copyright uh, uh, for like first pu for like first publishing rights and so on. Uh, uh, so I didn't want to just share it to just anyone. I, just, I didn't want to put it on the internet because I thought it might be sellable. So I said, you know what? I've got this idea, but I don't want to publish here because I do think I'm going to be able to sell it. And I, and I don't want to risk uh, not being able to sell first rights. Right. And, and so the guy looks at me and says, oh, so in other words, I was right. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, man, you were right. And he got to be right, and I got a six-book contract. <laughs> <laughs> Look, well, so many of these stories have happened because I'm a hard-headed, arrogant pig at times <laughs> that just can't back down from things. And uh, that's, that's how it goes. That's awesome. Uh, so we are unfortunately over time, and I know there's another interview coming in, and I don't want to um, encroach on their space. Uh, so sorry if we didn't get to your questions, uh, but I want to say thank you very much for this, Jen. This is a blast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good rest of the con. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys.